give to you this evening in this teaching we pray in Jesus name amen I want to start by reading from Psalm 33 verses 1 through 11 rejoice in the Lord O ye righteous for praise is comely for the upright praise the Lord with harp sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings sing unto him a new song play skillfully with a loud noise for the word of the lord is right and all his works are done in truth he loveth righteousness and judgment the earth is full of the goodness of the lord by the word of the lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth He gathered the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. I picked that psalm purposefully. Tonight we're going to open uh, into the book of John, the Gospel of John, uh, the fourth of the Gospels, and uh, it opens speaking about beginnings. I'm kind of interested in beginnings. I uh, have uh, a bit of an uh, interest in my own beginnings, you know, my family things, and I've gotten a couple of histories. delved around in them uh, a couple of years. Uh, I acquired, uh, it's almost like a pamphlet of a book. It's just copies and copies of handwritten things and little bits of history there and there of the family. And a couple of years ago, I started reading this and I developed an interest. I put it on my my, uh, uh, bucket list, something to do. And this last weekend, I got to fulfill that. Uh, we were not here on Sunday. We went up to Battleground, Washington. We were meeting with my grandnephew, who is a coach for a cheerleading team, a high school up in Washington, and they were having their state championships, and we went to observe, but we primarily went so that we could meet, of course, the best and only child ever born, which is their first child. And uh, we look forward to it. But it gave me the opportunity to fulfill this bucket list that I had. And that was to visit the Brush Prairie Baptist Church. The Brush Prairie Baptist Church has a long history. It goes back to 1863. And in the tracing of my lineage on my mother's side of the family, the Clark family, we can begin, the stuff that I have begins tracing them in the early years of America in the Revolutionary War and had several relatives that were involved in the Revolutionary War, one of them being John Clark. John Clark had uh, a bunch of sons and one of those sons' name was John and he became a circuit riding preacher and I, I was going all around and had a long uh, ministry, never longer than seven years in any one place. And he uh, uh, ended up in the Illinois area. And there he passed away. And his wife, uh, it was decided by the family that he had a son whose name was John. And it was decided that they were going to move from Illinois. And they were thinking of going to Texas. But mother said, no, I want to go to Oregon because that's where her son, Alvin, and her uh, daughter, Rosetta, went to someplace here in Oregon. And so that's where they went. And the 74-year-old woman walked most of the way from Illinois to Oregon. So don't any of you ladies ever complain about taking a trip to Portland. So 
they went out there, and somehow or another, in the coming out, John's uh, father-in-law, whose last name was Venata, uh, they ended up in Brush Prairie, Washington. And in 18, they got there in 1854, and in 1863, they began building the building there at Brush Prairie. And so it was Mr. Van Atta, his son-in-law, John Clark, and John's brother, Alvin Pitt Clark, whose son is named Alvin Pitt Clark, who is buried in the guard cemetery, and my mother is buried next to him because it was her favorite grandfather. And uh, so his father, so it would be my great-great-grandfather, who uh, worked and built the actual building of the Brush Prairie Church, which is not the building they're in now. And uh, he served as the first pastor of that church. I thought, well, that'd be interesting to go in. I stopped in. I got to visit with the, the uh, young pastor there, young, one of the people on staff, I believe, young man. And uh, it was fun. And, I, and so uh, I fulfilled my wish. It's a nice church. It's, the building is a nice building. I, and I assume the inhabitants are a nice church. And uh, it seems to be a, a nice going concern. And that's good. That's gratifying to see that. So beginnings can be kind of interesting. And John talks about beginnings. The book of John is the fourth gospel. And it was written much later than the first three. In fact, it's written about 30 years later than the first three. So there's been a lot of time for the church to grow and to uh, begin to mature and for uh, a lot of things to happen. And uh, it was a time for John, I think, of reflection. From other sources outside of the Bible, we know that John, at the time that he wrote this, was living in Ephesus, and he's about 100 years old. My father-in-law just turned 98. It's nice when you can be nearly 100 years old and still be able to walk around and, and maneuver and laugh and get along with people and all that, so it, it's, that's a pleasant thing. And obviously, John was able to do all of that. Because if you will recall, uh, he had just written the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation was written at about 95 AD when John was uh, exiled to the small island of Patmos. He was, uh, the church was under persecution from Titus Flavius Domitian. Uh, and he was exiled to Patmos, which is this misshapen hourglass-type island. It's got a kind of a funny top, and it comes to a narrow center, and then it goes down to a funny bottom. And it's uh, located about 200 miles west of Athens across the Aegean Sea. And if you're at all familiar with the area, that whole area's got a, just a raft of islands. There's just tons of islands out in that, leading to Patmos and along. And Patmos is actually very close to Turkey. It's only about 38 miles from uh, Miletus, and um, Miletus is just a little bit below where Ephesus is. And so John went to Patmos, and the result was, I guess, everybody on Patmos became Christians. And uh, today, it's not a heavily populated area. You look at it, there's only... Uh, you know, four populated areas. Uh, up in the northern part is uh, Campos, and in the middle part, right where it gets narrow, that's where uh, Scala is. And then you come a little bit south, and there's a, a hill, and then another hill, and right in that valley in there is where Patmos is uh, located. It's just kind of a village. And then over to the west of that is uh, an area called Lukakia Beach, and that appears to be uh, some kind of a tourist trap from what I could see. I looked at it at Google Earth, and you look down, and all the buildings have got these big swimming pools, and there's rows and rows of uh, little uh, cabanas out on the beach, and the boats are all moored there, so I'm figuring, figuring Patmos is probably a place to go on vacation today. And uh, that's where John had been, and then he immediately comes up to Ephesus, and that's where he's making his home at the end of his life, and that's where he was buried when he died. And John, the apostle, 
is certainly the source of this book. He's the author. But he's not necessarily the pensman. He probably talked about this and, and dictated as he went. And there was another John in Ephesus who was known as John the Elder, who was beloved by the uh, congregation at Ephesus, as was John the Apostle. And John the Elder very often referred to John the Apostle as the Apostle that Jesus loved. And so we see in this, uh, in this account as we go through the gospel that you never hear the author really talking about himself, but there are a couple places where he's referred to as the apostle that Jesus loved. And by now, the church has grown up, and if you remember in your reading of scripture, that Jesus has said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard tree. Now, that's an unnatural thing. He says, like a mustard seed, a little small, but it grows up, and it becomes a great tree, and the birds come and build their nest in the tree. And such is the case with the kingdom of heaven, even to this very day, that the churches grow up. Sometimes a movement starts out so nice and so good, and yet with the passage of time, the birds come and build nests in the tree, and it has a bad effect on the kingdom of heaven. And this is certainly the case as the church was growing in those days. And what happens is, is heresies come in. Now, heresies are not always great, big, stinking lies. A lot of times they're just little half-truths. Or maybe it's seizing upon a fact and then strangling it to death. And so heresies arose then, just as they do today, which is why we need to be steeped in what the word says and be able to relate verse to verse, book to book, age to age, so that we get the whole picture of something. And then we don't get so narrow and get sucked off by heresy. And we know in America today, there are a lot of heretical teachers who have quite large ministries, quite large and lucrative ministries, because there's a lot of money in religion. And we need to be aware of all of that. Two of the heresies that had arisen during that time, one of them was the elevation of John the Baptist. There were people who thought that he was very important, especially within the Jewish portion of uh, Christendom. And we know that there were places where he was kind of elevated. Uh, one of them we are, was related to us in Acts, the 19th chapter. And uh, this is how it says, reading uh, the uh, first seven verses, says it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. Oh, that's right where we are now and uh, we're going to be taking up. He came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So obviously their education was lacking. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Because you remember, John the Baptist came through ahead of Christ, and he wandered through the land, and he was a powerful preacher. And he told people, You need to repent. You have to turn back from the sin that you are performing. And he called them to repentance. And when they did, he baptized them into a baptism of repentance. But he made a prediction. He said, I baptize with water, but there's one coming after me. I'm not worthy to loosen up his shoelaces, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
And that's why Paul was looking to see that experience in their lives. And they said, we were baptized unto John's baptism. So verse 4, he says, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, and they prophesied, and all the men were about 12. So there were about 12 people in this. So there's your first heresy, that somebody who is meant to bring a message was elevated to a place where he did not want it to be, and yet the people elevated it to him long after his demise. And so there's one of the heresies that had to be dealt with. The second heresy that John had to deal with, the church was dealing with, and this is a, a very you know, abbreviated um, description. The second heresy is called Gnosticism. Gnosticism presented itself in several ways, and it, it kind of grew and then had branches. And uh, you know, uh, sometimes brainy people are too brainy for their own good, you know, and, and they get to believing their own press releases. And uh, so somebody came up with this great idea: say that, that material things are evil. So all the material world around us is evil, and spiritual things are good, and therefore, good cannot come in contact with evil. Hmm. Well, that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? But it precludes God from being able to deal with that which he created. And that, in fact, is what they said. Well, a holy God cannot come in contact with this dirty creation thing. And so what he did, they came up with a plan. What he did was, he had emanations of himself. So it's you know, one emanation after another. Nice big word. And everybody said, oh, that sounds reasonable because that's a big word. And they said that finally the emanations got far enough from God that that emanation was able to create the earth and all that is around us. And in fact, that emanation was so far from God that it had actually even forgotten about God and was kind of antithetical to God. It was kind of against God. So it wasn't even good at that point. Do you see how that takes away from the holiness of God in his actual Godhood? And then they would say, well, you know, this Jesus character, he was one of those emanations. That's it. He was one of those emanations. But he wasn't God. He was just an emanation of God. And so he takes away from the Godhood of Jesus also. And then they let it go a little bit further and they say, well, this Jesus, um, he's, uh, he's a phantom. And this became a branch of Gnosticism, and we call this docetism. And uh, it that uh, the word, uh, as I recall, I think the Greek word was uh, doke, and it meant a phantom. And so Jesus really wasn't a man. He was actually just a phantom. He lacked any weight. They said when he walked on the sand, he didn't leave footprints because he didn't have any weight to him. So he wasn't really a man. And then some people said, well, he... Had God came into it, because we know that at, when he went down and met John the Baptist, remember he, uh, John said he baptized Jesus. He's, and John said, you know, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, no, I want to fulfill all things. So he baptized me, and he did. And when he did, the, the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, remember? And the voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Listen to him. And that's good advice even to this day. And so they said at that time, that's when the spiritual part came into him. And then just before he was crucified, that spiritual part left him. 
And there were even rumors that why some people were talking with Jesus over on the, the Mount of Olives while Jesus was dying on the cross. See? And so they take away from Jesus his humanity. And so these are the heresies that John is having to deal with. Let's see if I forgot to open up this. So we begin. Verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He starts in the beginning. It's very much like Genesis 1.1, where the author of Genesis says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we know that there is a causative factor in all that surrounds us and even in ourselves. And that causation is God. But John starts a little bit earlier than the writer of Genesis does. Because the writer of Genesis is starting right there at that creation of heaven and earth. John says, no, before that happened, in the beginning, there was the word. There was the word, the communication of God, the strong communication of God, the tangible communication of God, the logos. And it says, then the word was with God. It brings that tangible communication closer to the Father. And then it says, the word was God. So in this understanding, somehow God exists in a way that, you know what, I don't think we can understand it. But we know it to be true. And so he is revealing himself in this manner to us. Just like before, he spent a lot of time revealing himself to us that he is a loving and a compassionate father. And he devised our family situations to be such that they would reflect what is going on in the kingdom of God and what life is all about. And so it behooves us who are fathers and grandfathers to be loving and compassionate and hands-on with our kids. Because that's how the Father is to us. And as good as we might try on an individual basis, he is oh so much better, ever so much better. So in the beginning, he exists. He is the communication of God. And he's with God, and he is God, and he is preexistent. There's no question of Jesus' status as John states it here. He's not remote. He's not separated from his creation. He is an integral part of it, and he is powerful, and he is creative. And it says the same in verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. There's never been any separation. He was always there, and he's the one who did it. And in verse 3, <coughs> we see that Jesus Christ is the sole creative force in this world. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. <coughs> this is some of the failing of those who wish to be intellectual and scientifically with it. And they said, well, God created it, but he did it through evolution. Well, evolution has nothing to do with creativity of God. It just simply says that by natural forces, one thing changed into another. And as we'll know when the conference is coming up this Saturday, I'm sure it'll be reiterated time and time again, 
One thing cannot change into another. We now know that it is genetically impossible for that to happen. And so we ought not to compromise. We are the ones who have access to the truth, and there's no reason to compromise. And if the whole world stands and laughs and makes fun, no matter. We are the ones that hold the truth, and they are the ones that need to learn that the God of creation who made everything about us, made all that's around us, and everything that he made screams at us that there is a creator God. And if there is a creator God, what have I to do with him? And what has he to do with me? Everyone needs to weigh that. And we better come into some kind of agreement with him if we want to inherit eternal life. All things were made by him, and without him not, was not anything made that was made. Now, you know, we're very much like God in a certain respect because it says that we are created in his image. We are different than all the other creatures on the earth, and there are some very unique and beautiful creatures on the earth and ones that confound us as to how they operate the way they operate, but they are perfectly designed to do whatever it is that God wants them to do, as are we. But we are the ones that it says are created in the image and likeness of God. And in that sense, there's a couple of things that we do. God has complete sovereignty over himself and over his creation. And he grants to us complete sovereignty over ourself and whatever he puts within our possession. And so we have the freedom to either choose or reject the one who made us. And we know that choosing and rejection is sometimes very painful. Because all of us have had times when there's been someone we loved who has rejected us. And perhaps they come back, we hope for them to come back, or whatever. But it's painful when that happens. And we're made in God's likeness. Because of that, we have a certain creativity, uh, a certain ability to do things. Now, I wanted to bring out in Hebrews, the first chapter, the third verse, because we're talking about Jesus as the sole creative force in this world. Hebrews 1.3 says, he uh, who, talking about Jesus, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. So not only is he the creator, he is also the upholder. It says upheld by the word of his power. Colossians, the first chapter, 15 through 17, it's talking again about the son that... Uh, that God has given us access to uh, and has given us access to the kingdom of his dear son. And it says, and, and through Jesus, it says we have redemption and, the, and uh, through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. And verse 15 uh, uh, picks up and it says that this Jesus says, who is the image of the invisible God. So if we want to know what God is like, we look to Jesus. Now, we don't look for a physical image because we don't know what Jesus looked like, no matter what pictures you might see. And I think that that's a, a negative thing that we try to know that. But we do know that he is the image of the invisible God, and so we can know the inner workings of what God is all about and what he wants for us by delving into the life of Jesus and the things that he said and taught. He said he's the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. We don't see everything, do we? But we freely breathe the air that God created that gives to us life itself. 
So he did the invisible and invisible, uh, the visible and the invisible, whether they be thrones. Paul tells us in Romans that he establishes all governments, doesn't he? Whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all of these things that we accept and that we bow to, actually, because a lot of these things demand things of us, primarily our tax money. And so it says that he is the creator of all those things. All things were created by him and for him. That says something about us. Because once we become connected to the living God and we decide that we are going to walk down that path, we come to the realization that we are not just created by him, we are created for him might give us a little bit of a different outlook on life and the things that we do and what we seek for. We're created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and then finally, by him, all things consist. They're held together. You know, scientists reduce things to the smallest particle. They get out their micron, uh, uh, their uh, electron microscope, and the electron microscope can look so far, so far into the tininess of all of creation that they stand there and go, whoa. We thought it was going to get simpler as we got smaller. And it doesn't. And then they say, we get down to this thing and we wonder, what holds it all together? There's no conceivable reason that everything doesn't just fly apart. And the only thing that holds it together is the power of his word. By him, all things consist. As I was saying, in our being created in the image of God, we're very much like him in our creativity. We are able, and we do, make stuff. We make lots of stuff. And some of it is very practical. Some of it is very beautiful. There are people who have artistic ability that I marvel at that they can do that. How is it that Michelangelo was able to take a huge chunk of marble, a huge chunk of marble, and bit by bit with chisel and hammer, he discards everything except the Pieta, or everything except David. How can he do that? How can someone look at something and see it so vividly in their mind that it flows through their veins and out to their hands and they can paint with such exactness that it's almost photographic? Well, that is just amazing to me. But the thing that we cannot do in all of our creativity, whether we create mechanical things or artistic things or intellectual things, which we do all of that. They say that the body of knowledge, they can measure the doubling. And it's, it's unbelievable. You know, at one point, you know, knowledge would, uh, would double every thousand years. And then it got to where knowledge was doubling every 100 years. And in the 20th century, it got to where knowledge was doubling every 50 years and then 20 years. And I think we're up to the, right now to the point with computers and who knows what will happen with artificial intelligence. I suspect nothing good. But with all of this uh, computing ability that we have, they say right now that knowledge is doubling every two years. That's happened in my lifetime, my goodness. It's unbelievable. And none of us can know everything, can we? Not at that rate. I know I can't absorb that, nor do I want to even try. But the one thing that we don't have in all of our creativity is the ability to grant life. Life. Verse 4 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Nature tells us 
that what is next for us is absolutely marvelous. Because you see, the life that we live is not clearly in focus. I remember as a little boy going down here onto 15th Street where my parents had, or my grandparents had bought a brand new house down there on 15th Street. That house has only had three owners. My grandparents, they sold it to Chet, uh, Chet's Electric and uh, Cora ran the, uh, the uh, hair salon out of it until you know, well into her 90s and then she's finally passed away and the family sold the house, so it's now on its third owner since 1955. And uh, I remember my grandparents were early adopters, and so they had in their house a television set, and we loved to go over there and watch the television set. I even liked the the commercials, you remember the Nally Valley had the cans that came marching down you know, to Nally Valley or the Jolly Green Giant, ho, 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 and uh, things like that. And then there were programs that we watched. I don't remember them so much as I do the, the commercials because the commercials were more frequent than the programs. But we watched this, and it was through a continual haze of snowflakes that were coming down in the picture. You know, you'd see this black and white picture through the little snowflakes that were there. And we thought, oh, man, that's fantastic. We were thrilled by it. Well, the life that we are living now, as vivid as it might be and as beautiful as it might be anywhere that we go, it's like watching that program through the snow. It's going to be ever so much more vivid and beautiful. I think of how nature teaches us this because every year everything dies, and even us. Look at us. We started out young and beautiful, and now we're just growing old and getting more feeble and things breaking down and all that. And we long now for the new body that's going to replace this aching thing that we're having to put up with right now. And so everything diminishes. And the Bible says this. You know, we go through the seasons. We have them. And I can remember every year when, out on the, when we had the great gardens out in Bend. Every year it all turned brown. It died back and, and all. And sometimes uh, most of the stuff was made to come back, and in the spring it would flourish. But, you know, I remember that one time, uh, it was the year of the best garden. It was the year that we had the wedding and all the spring flowers bloomed late and all the summer flowers bloomed early. And I went out that spring, I hadn't done it before, but we had planted on the north side of the property, we had planted 20 uh, aspen trees. And I planted them there because they were so invasive and I didn't have to worry about them coming up in anything. And those 20 trees became 40 trees in no time at all. And they grew up uh, big enough that they were quite mature in time for the wedding. But that year, I had these little tiny black seeds. They're just ugly. They were insignificant. And you would probably, on just seeing it, would discard them and think that they were crumbs or something because each one was no bigger than the period at the end of a sentence. And I took those black seeds and I flung them all out all under all those trees. And that year, and it was the only year that it really did it, but they all bloomed. Poppies came up. And it was just a sea of orange and red under the, the beautiful aspen trees that would shake in the breeze and all. And it made that side of the property just absolutely gorgeous. It was beautiful. Think about that, how the garden dies back. But in the spring, it begins to come up and to turn green. And it becomes, you know, starts to bloom. And by summer, there's some beautiful, beautiful flowers, and there's nothing more, more stunning and more amazing to me than the variety of flowers that come up. And you get up to them close and you look at them. You know, there are paintings you have to look at from a block away in order to be able to see what they are. But a flower, you can get right up close to it and just marvel at how intricate and how beautiful and how vivid that flower is. And that, friends, is what heaven is like. It's ever so much more beautiful than what we can even imagine or think. And it is Jesus Christ 
who gives that kind of life into the creation. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Because when we give our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, he adds a dimension to every aspect of our life that gives us direction and insight and and the ability to see a little bit further. It's like having a real good set of driving lights because we are surrounded by a lot of darkness. And we'll talk more about this darkness. But this life is the light of men. And verse 5 says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That word comprehend is uh, catalambano. Catalambano. And it means to seize upon or to comprehend, to understand, to apprehend. And so in both senses of the word, darkness doesn't understand. Darkness does not understand the light. All darkness knows is that when the light comes, it must leave. And the darkness has no power to extinguish the light. The darkness can only come back if the light is removed. The light shineth in the darkness. The darkness does not comprehend. In verse 6, we have an introduction of a new character, one we know are familiar with. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. John, as you remember from the other Gospels, is the cousin of or I guess he's not a first cousin because Mary and Elizabeth are cousins. So does that make him a cousin once removed? Uh, Something like that? I don't know. I never understood those relationships. I know a second cousin would be my uncle's... No, those would be my first cousins. Be my uncle's brothers or something. Don't try to figure it out, but they were related, folks. And Elizabeth, by miracle of miracles, became pregnant and gave birth to this son. And when uh, uh, his daddy wrote and scribbled on the tablet, his name shall be John, because they wanted to name him Zacharias. And he said, no, his name is going to be John, because that's what the angel told him. And he's, thank goodness he remembered that. And he wrote John, and when he did, his voice was freed and he could speak again. He had been without the ability to speak for nine months. And here was this new little baby. Well, when Elizabeth was six months along, so she's only got about three months to go. That's when Mary came to visit, you remember? And Mary is also pregnant. And Elizabeth says, oh, when you came in, the baby in my womb jumped. I mean, didn't just kick. He jumped. He leapt for joy to be in the presence of his Lord. And so he's definitely older. And I wonder, there had to be times during their childhood that they interacted. But John has a complete knowledge of who Jesus is. And so this John comes on the scene, and I want to indicate here that he was sent by God. He was brought about for a particular purpose. And he was aware of his purpose, and he embraced that purpose, and he accomplished that purpose. And you know what? It's not beyond the realm of possibility that you, whoever you might be, or I, might be sent by God for a particular purpose. So pay attention in your life. Because there have been times, I know that people I have met and have talked to and all, and they have affected my life in a particular way. 
And I thank God that he sent them into my life. And I hope that there are people that I have impacted that will thank God that he sent me to do that. And the fact is, is God can send you into your family, into your neighborhood, into your community, into your country, somehow. And it's for a purpose. And we want to embrace that. And so this John, in the verse 7, says, He came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He's simply a witness. He's just simply there to direct people to the source of life and light and takes nothing for himself. He asked nothing for himself. And he got nothing for himself in a certain sense because it said, what did he do? He spent his life wandering in the wilderness wearing goat skins or whatnot and eating grasshoppers. That's not exactly sumptuous living. And it's certainly not the kind of living that those who, in the name of Christ, establish these great ministries and fly around in private jets and find that one is not good enough. They need a second one. Well, they could take a lesson from John as to what their motivation ought to be. He came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. And that's the goal that we have for all that we come in contact. We cherish that, we, we covet that for our children and for those that are about us, that they might come to a place where they believe because that is the transitional place in life. What we were before we believe and what we are after we believe. How we are a disappointment and then we are a credit simply because of our belief. It's a powerful thing to believe. Verse 8 said, he was not that light. John knew who he was, and he knew he wasn't that. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. See how John is putting that heresy to bed? That John fulfilled his purpose, and he was not above the Lord Jesus Christ. He was simply sent to bear witness of that light, and he did it. He had no other ambition in life. I remember one time years ago, and it's, I suppose, apropos to talk about this, because in a sense, this, uh, this gospel that's being written here is a collaboration. I can just see the old men of the church getting together and saying, John, you need to write this down. We need to get this recorded. Tell us about what, tell us about what happened. Tell us about what happened. And it's pleasant to do that. And so a lot of times we talk about that even in our beginnings. It's fun to sit down with Anthony and Alandrina and talk about how they came here and they had nothing and then God did this and God did that and then the church got established and they were in this place and then went to that place and it grew here and then it shrunk and then it grew and then we were in one place and we moved to another. And it's kind of good for us to know how the journey goes. And so years ago, back in the... Uh, uh, late 70s, I would say. Yeah, it was late 70s because we didn't move from San Diego until 1978. So it was probably about 1976, 75, 76. And uh, for some reason, I, and I don't even remember the circumstances, but I went with a group of other men. There were, I think, four or five of us that went from San Diego up to Costa Mesa, and we had a kind of a ministry meeting with uh, Chuck Smith. So we got to sit down with him. It was a very small group, and, uh, and it was a very fun experience. I, I enjoyed it immensely. And uh, Chuck Smith was a very engaging person, very approachable, uh, very unassuming. He did not have any airs whatsoever. 
In fact, at the time, there were two churches that were growing big. One church was the Crystal Cathedral uh, with uh, Robert uh, uh, Muller, and the other one was Calvary Chapel, which was growing by leaps and bounds, and I think was bigger than the, than the uh, Glass Cathedral. And the Glass Cathedral, uh, he, he said that he attributed his uh, growth of the church to uh, excess parking. And I know Chuck said, he attributed, he says, people come to me and there's groups come to me and one thing or another and want to know, what is our method? How did we do this? What was, what was the scheme? What was the plan and everything else? He says, I have no idea. He says, this is just something that God wanted to do and so he did it. He said, when I came to this church, I wanted to make these the 25 most knowledgeable people in the Bible. And he says, I don't have any, I'm a hippie. He says, I don't have any ambition. I, I, all I want to do now is just make these the 25,000 most knowledgeable people in the Bible. And everybody will attest to that. You see the pictures on our magazine where he's walking along holding the hand of a little kid, you know. And I, I've heard the stories of going in and he's cleaning the toilet. See? So there's a difference in the approach. He had more understanding and grasp of John the Baptist, whose only purpose was to lead people to the light. Let them see Jesus. He was simply a witness. And verse 8 says that although he was important, he was not the most important. And it says here that Jesus is the true light. Verse 9 says he was in the world at no, pardon me, uh, he, he, Jesus says, that light, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And so he's leading the way for Jesus, who is that true light. Kind of made me think of uh, when you get to the very end of, uh, hmm, I don't have it here. Oh, I, I do have it here. I turned to it and didn't realize it. I, I was thinking of the end of uh, Revelation, the 22nd chapter. And it talks about when we're in the perfect situation. We're in the presence of God. And we're in the holy city, you know, and the, the river of life that flows from the throne of, of, of God. And the, and the tree in the garden that bears fruit every month of the year. And it has a uh, different fruit for it and all that. And it says there in uh, chapter 22 and verse 5, it says, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle. You're not going to need flashlights when you get to heaven. It says, neither light of the sun. So even in the daytime, we aren't going to need the light nor the heat of the sun to sustain us. It says, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The Lord God given them, giveth them light. And I've got to think, that, and this, of course, is just speculation on my part and is not to be taken as absolute truth, nor scientific even. But I've got a feeling that when we get to heaven, that there's going to be light everywhere and there will be no shadows. Because light will be everywhere from the Lord Jesus Christ from God, who is everywhere. Jesus is that true life. And think of the disappointment for him. Verse 10 says he came here and he was incognito. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. They didn't recognize him for who he was. Think of the amount of humility that takes to walk into a room and not say, I made that. Here he was, a demonstration and, 
And he's described in a couple verses here in such a beautiful, beautiful way. And he came into this world, the world that he made. We even remember when he talked, and he was up looking down on Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I'd love to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks and have you under their wings. But, but you would not. You would not. What a sad, sad thing for him to deal with. And he says he came unto his own, verse 11, he came unto his own, he came to his Jewish people. These people that he had brought through the water, had brought them to safety out of slavery and had delivered them into a, 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 a freedom, a true freedom. And they come into the land and how many times had he bailed them out where he fought their battles and defeated their enemies? came to his own, and his own received him not. He was rejected. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. That, my friends, is rejection. That is rejection. But verse 12 takes us to the good news. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. I don't want anybody to get hung up here in the... Uh, uh, cultural limitations that we have today where there would be com complaint how dare you be so exclusive and, re and, and not refer to the women that it's only sons of God well I'll tell you technically here is what it is the word is technon and it means a child a child. And so he gives us all that ability to become his children. That is a very close relationship. That's an adoption that is really, really meaningful. It is definitely a life changer. And I've thought of some people that have been adopted and thought, what a marvelous thing that is. That there are people who will open their hearts to take someone in who is not flesh and blood. When we have flesh and blood, when we have children that are born, it is a magical thing. And the bond is unbreakable. And we cling to that person and we love that person even into their adulthood. And we are concerned for them and we pray for them and we we love them and we encourage them and we support them. And somebody who is bringing someone who is outside of their family and brings them in and gives them that, what a marvelous thing that is. And I've thought of some people who have had you know, a pretty dismal background that they, came, that they were plucked out of as an infant and were given such marvelous opportunity because of the love of someone who will open their heart. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, when we receive him, oh, does he receive us. And he gives us this power that we have this closeness that we become his child. And it's even to them that believe on his name. And again, we hit that key word, believe. Believe. And in verse 13 says, These people who believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, not of that relationship that comes out of being born in a family, a husband and a wife having a child, we're not into God's family because of blood. We're not into God's family by the will of the flesh, we cannot pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps and throw ourselves into God's family. 
There is nothing that we can do. There are no deeds that we can do. There's no sacrifice we can make. There is nothing that we can do other than to believe in order to get into God's family. And he offers it freely to all who will do, he will accept. So it's not by blood, it's not by the will of the flesh, nor is it by the will of man. There is nothing that I can do to will you into the family of God. And we know for a fact that if it was possible, for some, we would give our very life that they might be brought into God's family. But we cannot. It can't be done by natural. It can't be done by self. And it can't be done by external. But by God. And that, my friends, is the beginning of the Gospel of John. And it is good news by God. And then we see the truth that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I can't help but think this wonderful description by an old and aged man who's looking back vividly on a past that is just bright shining and seared into his memory because as a young man, he lived it day by day with the... King of kings and the Lord of lords. And his experience at the end of that is to say, and the word became flesh. This God, God himself, the one who was, was spoken, was with God, and was in fact God. And this God, he deigned to become something less than he was. He became flesh. He became as I am. And he dwelt among us. He interacted. He talked with us. He walked with us. He ate with us. He laughed with us. He cried with us. He taught us. And didn't our hearts burn when he taught us? This man, the only begotten of the Father, there was a glory to him. I, I, I can't explain it. There was a glory. He was the only begotten of the Father. And he was full of grace and truth. Everything about his life was pleasant and graceful. And he was always truthful and is even now. And John bare witness of him, John the Baptist again. And John cried to the people saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Wait a second, John's older. And he says, Jesus is before me. Don't you know that Jesus said that before Moses, I am. And all the fullness, and of his fullness, and of his fullness, Everything that Christ has, everything that Jesus brought to the table. And of his fullness, verse 16, have all we received. And grace for grace. It is all available to us. Even after 2,000 years, just as John declared it, it is available to us. Grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He added a whole new dimension of life lived in the presence of God. Because God allowed us to have a long teaching period, a time, because as you recall it, that Paul referred to the, the law as a tutor that just showed us how miserable, you know, despicable people we are. 
Oh, we tried those, got those 10 rules, just 10 rules. And of course, there are always people that think they can improve on anything God does. And so they, the Jewish people added another 600. You know, they, that's what happens to all, all bureaucracies to get out of control. When you get in the business of making rules for people, there's no end to it. Because once you've got one rule, you've got to go to work and make the next rule. Otherwise, you're not earning your keep. And they sure did it in spades. But just keep the 10 rules, just 10. Forget about the 600. Keep only 10. And we look at it, we say, I can't do it. I worked as hard as I could, you know, and I even lied about it and said that I did it. And Jesus says, boy, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, there's no hope for you. That should give us pause. So the law was given by Moses, but that grace and acceptance and that mercy and forgiveness regeneration, that being made new, being born again, that's given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Well, you know what? We have the same problem that mankind has always had. We say, oh, you can't see it. You can't see him. How can we be devoted to someone we can't see? We haven't heard him, unless we do like Anthony says, you know, well, just read the Bible out loud, then you can hear him. And John admits that. He says, no man hath seen God at any time. It hasn't happened since the beginning of creation. No man has seen God in his fullness. We've only seen how he presented himself to us as the man, Christ Jesus. Exodus. Moses wanted to be able to see God and uh, get into Exodus chapter uh, 33, verse 20. This is, and he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. That the glory of God is so great that we will not be able to see him until we also receive our glorified body, which will allow us to be physically and personally in the presence of God Almighty and his son, Christ Jesus, creator of heaven and earth, and we ourselves. But until then, you can't see him and live, and so he hides himself from us. He is invisible. The invisible God who said, make no graven image. And so a lot of times we want to, and we've tried to, and they've made paintings and stuff. I remember one of the most common ones is, I think it was done by Holman Hunt or something, and it hangs in a lot of Christians' houses. And it hangs there, and I can't help but think that it was God who said, make no graven image. This, to me personally, is one of the impediments of some of the movies that are made. I, I have seen a couple of the episodes of The Chosen, and it's a very well done. And there's some real interesting insights that can be drawn from it, I think. But I only watched a few, and I thought, you know what? God says, make no graven image. Because that will forever shape my picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that picture of the Lord Jesus Christ should be forever shapen by that which he has revealed within his word the invisible God, the one that we can't see, the one who there's no particular comeliness, there's no beauty to him that we should be drawn to him. Perhaps he was kind of homely. I don't know if the Shroud of Turin is real, but the guy that's in there is not real handsome. The invisible God. So all we can know of him is what Jesus taught. And I go back to Hebrews, the first chapter, the first three verses. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us, that word, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds 
who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and the upholding of all things by the word of his power. If we want to know God, we have to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And no better place than here in the book of John. Oh Lord, we are so grateful that you dealt with John the way that you did. That you extended his life. In fact, that you gave him a natural life. A longer life, for we know that you grant to us 70, 80 years. And he got to have 100 and in his old age that he was encouraged and took up the challenge to write down all that he experienced in walking with you in those three years. And Lord, I pray that you would inspire us, that we would walk with you all the days of our years and in gratitude accept that which you give to us. Lord, you to be praised, honored, and glorified and we do so. In Christ Jesus' name, amen.